All right, what is the message? Verse 8 and following. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. So this righteousness comes through a word. The word of the gospel. The message of the gospel is the only key that opens to you the door to the righteousness of faith. Think how important that makes it. Until this message is proclaimed, people, even if they long to attain to righteousness, cannot. What an obligation we have to proclaim it to the whole of the human race. Not just sit in church on Sunday mornings and sing a few hymns. That doesn't discharge our debt to humanity. What does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching. Notice that in achieving righteousness by faith, there are two parts of the human personality that must be involved. The mouth and the heart. And in these three verses, Paul uses each of them three times. And the first two times, it's the mouth and then the heart. The last time, it's the heart and then the mouth. I think that's very significant. It's not exactly easy to know what's in our heart. In fact, the only person who really knows the heart is the Lord. So if you want something in your heart, how do you get it there? By saying it with your mouth. By repeating it. Uh, it may seem as though nothing is happening, but after a while, it happens. It's very interesting because the, when we say in English, to learn by heart, Hebrew says, to learn by mouth. How do you learn by heart? By repeating with your mouth the same phrase again and again until it's got to where? Your heart. Then you don't have any more effort. That's why it's so important to memorize scripture. Because when you've memorized it, there's no more effort. Ruth and I have got probably 50 passages of scripture we've memorized. It's no effort to us. I could call her up here and she could, we could stay them together. Because we have repeated them so often, they're in our heart. So if you believe the Bible, if you receive the message, then the way to get it into your heart is by way of your mouth. You understand? This is a real important key. Let me just read those words. Verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the clearest single statement in one verse of how to be saved. You confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Notice if you don't believe in his resurrection, you cannot be saved. I said that in the previous session. And then the third time, Paul changes the order. For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. We need to know the meaning of the word confess. It's, uh, the, the English word is derived from a Latin word, which means to say the same as, and that's the meaning of the word in the Greek text. It means to say the same as. So confession for us as Bible-believing Christians means we say the same thing with our mouths as God has said in his word. Now you're not free to add to the word and you should not take away from it. You don't immediately believe it. Like Jesus himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. With his wounds we are healed. You say, but I'm sick. Well, that's true. It's perfectly correct. You are sick, but it's not what the word says. So you have to make a decision whether you're going to side with the word or side with the symptom. And this is not a quick and easy decision. It's something that has to be worked out, you see. As a matter of fact, my dear brother here has got a wonderful testimony of how he was healed of, what do you call that thing? Hmm? Sugar diabetes. He was diagnosed, that's Terry there, he was diagnosed as having diabetes in an acute stage. And I, of course he should give this testimony, but I'm seeing him there, it comes to mind. He simply said, Doctor, I don't receive that. With his wounds I'm healed. And here he is, totally free from diabetes. 
That's just a rather dramatic example. Now, this is not a system. You can't make it work. It has to come from the heart, you see? You've got to believe in the heart. It's one thing to believe in the mind. It's another thing to believe in the heart. How do you get it to the heart? By way of the mouth. You see what I'm saying? You've got to do two things. Confess Jesus with your mouth as Lord. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That's the basic requirement for salvation. And if you're not sure whether you believe it, but you're sincere and you believe the Bible is God's word, just keep saying it with your mouth. I'm looking at my wife here in front of us. We have been doing this for three years. And it's taken a lot of guts to say that, use a rather vulgar word. But we have held on to it. We have not let go. And it's working. It's working. It's not been easy. Nobody says it will be easy. But that's God's way. We can't substitute some other way. No, I'm just talking about healing of sickness because the word salvation is the all-inclusive biblical word for everything that was accomplished by the death of Jesus on the cross. And if I were to start into that subject now, I would not get back, so I have to redirect myself. All right, let's go on with Romans 10. Paul goes on to point out in verses 11 and following that this plan of salvation is open to everybody. It's not restricted to Jews, but it's for whosoever. He says, for the scripture says, whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. That's Isaiah 28, 16. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek in this respect that we're all sinners and God has provided the same remedy for all of us. For the same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches for all who call upon him. And then verse 13, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth, Call upon the name of the Lord, and it works for whoever. It's marvelous when one has the privilege of dealing with people who have no religious background or no Christian background. And you simply explain it to them this simply, and they do it, and it works. You know, They don't have any idea about church or hymns or things like that, but they just lay hold of this fun fact. You've got to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth Call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Millions and millions have been saved that way. Isn't that wonderful? This is not some abstract theory. This is something that works. Like everything that God says, it works. Now, I've come to one of my favorite scriptures, which is Romans 10, 17. I'm skipping out 16 because I'm going back to it. All right. So faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ or the word of God. Either is possible. See, if you don't have faith, you can get it. This is, this is a word of encouragement. During my military service, I was one year on end in a military hospital in Egypt. And Egypt is not the place to choose to be in hospital. With a condition that the doctors were not able to cure. I had just come to know the Lord, been baptized in the Spirit, but had no kind of religious context. And as I lay there in the bed, I said to myself, day after day, I know if I had faith, God would heal me. But the next thing I always said was, but I don't have faith. And when I said that, I was in a long, dark valley of despair. But one day, a glorious ray of light shone into that darkness. You know where it came from? Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. If you don't have faith, you can get it. Listen, it comes, it comes, it comes. You don't have to sit there in despair and say, I have no faith. There's a way to get faith. 
And I want to explain the way because it's important. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by Rhema, the proclaimed word of God. The first step is not, the first stage is not faith, it's hearing. But when you've, when the word produces hearing, out of hearing, faith comes. I saw such a vivid illustration of this early in my ministry. Some of you might not picture me this way, but I used to be a street preacher in the streets of London. For eight years, I preached on the streets of London. I'm very used to open air preaching. In fact, it's a good way to learn to preach because you don't have any notes and you, you don't have a concordance and you've probably got a lot of opposition and you really come out with what you've got and that's all you have. Anyhow, I was preaching one evening and there was quite a crowd of maybe a hundred people gathered around listening. It was a fine summer evening in London and uh, a young man came walking past, sauntering past. He wasn't really going anywhere. He was just wandering along. I saw a look of scorn on his face and he said to himself, what's that idiot talking about? Little of that ring. But he stopped. And he began to listen. And all the time I spoke for another 10 or 15 minutes, I was watching his face. And gradually the smirk disappeared. And a look of real intense interest came in his eyes. So when I got to the end, I did something I often did. I said, now if anybody here wants to be saved, I'm going to pray a prayer out loud in the middle of this ring, sentence by sentence. You can pray the same prayer after me in your heart. And if you really mean it, you'll be saved. So I prayed a simple prayer asking for salvation, opened my eyes and looked at that young man and his face was changed. So I walked straight up to him and said, you've just prayed that prayer, haven't you? And he said, yes, I did. And what a demonstration that was to me because he came past 20 minutes earlier as a complete unbeliever. But he stopped and he began to hear, you see? And out of hearing, faith developed. And he could be saved. There but one problem with many of us as Christians is we don't take time to hear. We open our Bible, read a chapter, close the Bible and go off to work or the kitchen or wherever. It takes time for faith to develop. You need to spend time in front of your Bible. I don't, it's not my job to tell you how to make the time. But let me tell you this, people find time for the things they consider really important. If you consider it important enough, you'll find time. <clears throat> so that's it. Out of that faith, you can fulfill the requirements for salvation. You can call upon the name of the Lord and you will be saved. Now Paul comes back to a thing which was a great problem for him. You can see him struggling with it. Why didn't my Jewish people believe? And so we're going to look at that for a moment. Going back to Romans 10, verse 16, going back one verse. However, they did not all heed the glad tidings. For, uh, well, we should have looked at verse 15, because he's quoting Isaiah, that beautiful passage. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring glad tidings of good things. He's saying, this is a picture of the people carrying the message of the gospel. Then he says, However, they did not all heed the glad tidings. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? You know where that quotation is taken from? It's the first verse of Isaiah chapter 53. And Isaiah chapter 53 is the most complete prophetic unveiling of the atonement of Jesus Christ. But there's a warning. Not everybody's going to believe. Do you understand that? The problem is not that God hasn't provided the solution. The problem is we don't accept it with faith. And so Paul wrestling with this issue, why didn't my Jewish brothers believe? He goes back to the scriptures and says, Isaiah warned us. Who has believed our report? Not everybody. And then he goes on to say, and now we're going to Verse 7, 6, 18, sorry, verse 8. We're missing out verse 17 because I've already dealt with it. But I say, surely they have never heard, have they? Indeed they have. It's not because they didn't hear. And then he quotes Psalm 19 about the testimony of the sun, the moon, and the stars. But he applies it to the message of the gospel. 
Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. So he said, it's been proclaimed. See, when Jesus said to his disciples in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to every creature. From that time, it was proclaimed. Jesus had released the word into all the world. That still means you and I have got to take the word. But it has been released. Until Jesus spoke those words, there was no authority for anybody to go and do it. So Paul says, now the word has been released. And then he says, verse 19, but I say, surely Israel did not know, did they? And then he answers his own question. On the contrary, Moses, the great authority, warned us. And he quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 30, is it? 30, yes. No, I'm sorry. Deuteronomy 32, thank you. Now, I'm not going to turn to Deuteronomy 32. I'm just going to read the quotation here. Moses says to Israel, I will make you jealous by that which is not a nation, by a nation without understanding, I will anger you. Now it's a good question, what is the foolish nation? You and me, the Gentiles, you see. We are a foolish nation by comparison with Israel. Because Israel had had 15 centuries of God's instruction. They were set apart. But God is going to, and he has done, anger the Jews by accepting a people whom they despise. I mean, we have to face that fact. Even today, in Hebrew language, to a lot of people, the word goy is a term of contempt. Goy is the Hebrew word for Gentile nation. So God took the silly Gentiles to provoke the religious and clever Jews. And he warned them that he was going to do it. But, and um, in, in Deuteronomy 32, Moses said, they've provoked me to jealousy by that which is not a God, by their idols. I'll provoke them to jealousy by that which is not a people. You have to understand there are two words in Hebrew. One is an, the other is goi. Am is people, goi is nation. Am is a nation that has a covenant relationship with God. There was only one Am in the world until the gospel. That was Israel. Now, we also are a people that have a covenant relationship with God. Not the Americans, the British, but the church of Jesus Christ. We are a people. And that was designed by God to provoke the Jews to jealousy. One thing that's tragic to me is that really over the centuries, the church has done so little to make the Jews jealous. I have a friend, Larry Tomczak, known to many of you. And I was with him ministry just a week ago. And in his book that tells his life story, he tells how he was working for a very intelligent and influential Jew who was the head of the AFL-CIO in Washington. And Larry, a new believer with enthusiasm, was witnessing to this man with wisdom and tact. And the man didn't reject his witness, but he said, when I find something in Christianity that's better than what I have as a Jew, I'll accept. And that is the attitude of many Jewish people. And honestly, if you were a Jew and you looked at the church from the outside, as presented in the media and as in the lives of some people, why would you want to change? Basically, the Jewish people take much better care of their own than the church does. I happen to know that because of the experience of my wife, Ruth. I don't think it's appropriate for me to go into this, but she converted to Judaism, was a practicing Jewess for 
more than 20 years. And when her marriage broke up and her family fell apart, the whole synagogue rallied around her. They didn't leave her. How, how many times does that happen in a Christian congregation? See, there's a real challenge. We're supposed to be making the Jews jealous. And you know, I'm not Jewish, but you know Jewish people, when they see something that works, they want it. They say, show me if it works, I'll buy it. Well, they can't buy this, but they'll get it. All right. Then we're still in this theme of how come that Israel didn't believe and Paul always goes for an answer to the Bible. He doesn't go anywhere else to the prophets. And so he quotes in verse 20, something that's found in Isaiah chapter 55. I was found, the Lord says, I was found by those who sought me not. I became manifest to those who did not ask for me. Who were those who did not seek, did not ask? The Gentiles, that's right. But as for Israel, he says, all the day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. So Paul says, and I mean, he's really got his Jewish brothers in mind. He says, we were warned. We couldn't say that it would never happen to us because our own prophets told us. Our own Moses said, God's going to make us jealous by people that really aren't a people by people that are on a different level from us, spiritually and even intellectually. And then through Isaiah, the Lord said, I've stretched out my hands to you all day long and you've not obeyed me. But I've been found by people that weren't even looking for me. So you see, to sum it up, the difference between the righteousness of faith and the righteousness of law. The righteousness of law says, I do this, I do that, I keep this, I keep that. Therefore, I am righteous. And Paul says earlier in Romans, and we looked at it, boasting is excluded by the law of faith. What does that imply? That if, if you're righteous by keeping a law, you've got something to boast about. And what is the motive that makes you want to boast? In one simple, simple word, pride. You see, the root problem. It's pride. Let me ask you this question. In the history of the universe, what was the first sin? Pride, that's right. And when the devil comes to tempt you and me, he can't do anything more than what brought about his own disaster. That's where he always aimed. And what, what is the greatest single factor that creates pride in human beings? Now, there are many possible answers. But I'll tell you what I believe. Religion. Religion is the single greatest source of pride. Uh, I never believed that communism would hold a grip on the Russian people for, for very long, because I know the soul of the Russian people. But believe me, brothers and sisters, there's a much more dangerous alternative coming, which is religion, religiosity. I personally believe we just got a short interval between the demise of communism and the rise of a religious system which will be much more enslaving than atheistic communism. I mean, the devil will use anything. He used communism, but it's not his number one weapon. His number one weapon is religion because it appeals to human pride. You see that? And I'll also say this, which is just a little extra. If you ever fall into deception, or erroneous teaching, your root problem will be pride. The only thing that opens the way to deception in a believer is pride. And you find almost all errors appeal to pride. If you join this group, you'll be more spiritual. This is the group of overcomers. We're the ones who've got the answer. Join us and you'll be right. My comment is, if you join them, you can be sure of one thing, you're wrong. Now, this is the motive behind almost every cult. We're the right people. We are better than others. We have more knowledge than others. We have a higher revelation than others. But the same thing permeates the church. I've got this doctrine, therefore, 
I am more righteous than the people who don't have this doctrine. And the, the only solution is humility. We have to humble ourselves. Humility and faith go together. Pride and unbelief go together. See, God's method of salvation through faith undercuts all human pride. It leaves us nothing to boast about, except, as Paul said, the cross. Well, let's move on into Romans chapter 11, which we will not be able to go very far. But then God, Paul raises this crucial question, which keeps coming up and is one of the primary questions in the world today, in the church today. Romans 11, verse 1. I say then, has God rejected his, God has not rejected his people, has he? They have in Greek a form of a question that expects the answer no. And Paul uses that. God has not rejected his people, has he? Expecting the answer no. May it never be, halila in Hebrew. When we were going through the first part of Romans, you remember what I suggested? Perish the thought. How can we entertain such a thought? God has not rejected his people, has he? Perish the thought. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul says, I am proof that God has not rejected the entire Jewish people. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. You understand? We come back again and again to that decisive factor. Those whom God has chosen and foreknown are his people. I don't believe there are going to be any surprises for God in eternity. There may be a lot of surprises for us. Well, brother, I never expected to see you here. <laughs> you didn't have the right doctrine and you didn't belong to the right group. I don't know how you made it. But the most shocking surprise of all would be if we didn't get there, wouldn't it? So, but God has numbered the elect. That's my personal conviction. He knows ex exactly how many seats to put around the table for the banquet, the marriage supper of the Lamb. And there'll be a place card in each place. All you have to do is walk around until you find your place. It's already appointed. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And then we come back to this period in the history of Israel when Elijah was the main prophet. Do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. The old King James says he makes intercession against Israel. That's always gripped me. Here's a prophet of God making intercession against God's people. I believe it was a weakness in Elijah. I don't believe we should ever make intercession against the people of God. Uh, I, I can understand. I've often felt like doing it myself. But I think it's a weakness. We should not yield to it. What did Elijah say? He said, Lord, they have killed thy prophets. They have torn down thine altars. And I alone am left. And they are seeking my life. And he had to go all the way to Mount Sinai and get back to where the law was given and have a personal interview with the Lord. And you remember, it was a dramatic inter interview. He was there on the mountain and a wind passed by and tore the rocks, but he was, the Lord wasn't in the wind. And then there was an earthquake, but the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And then there was a fire, but the Lord wasn't in the fire. And then there was what used to be called a still small voice. The modern translations say a sound of gentle blowing. And that was more impressive and more authoritative than the wind, the earthquake, and the fire. It was just the voice of God. You see, when you hear God's voice, it doesn't, he doesn't have to shout. He can shout. But when you hear God's voice, in a the way, the most precious experience is just to have that quiet, authoritative voice that tells you just how things are. And so... The Lord corrected Elijah, said, you got your figures wrong. What was the divine response to him? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Notice again the emphasis on God's grace. I have kept for myself. They didn't keep themselves. 
I have kept them. They are my reserved remnant. And then Paul goes on to say, in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. That's the translation here, but the literal translation is according to the choice of grace. So we come back to this theme. It's grace that makes God's sovereign choice, and God's choice is what settles who his people are to be. And God has a remnant both in Israel and in the church. Can you accept that? I believe the same principles apply. That's why it's so important we study the facts about Israel, because they apply in principle to us. So God helping us in the next session, we will complete Romans chapter 11 with help from God.